Well, welcome everybody uh, to this evening's International Women in Biomedicine event. It's a very special conversation with Professor Edith Hurd, Fellow of the Royal Society, Director General of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, or EMBL, and of course, world leader in molecular biology research. We in Australia acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. We're of course meeting online tonight, but I'm here in Melbourne and acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land, the Wurundjeri people. This evening's event forms part of an International Women in Biomedicine series, which is an initiative of the Convergence Science Network. And for those of you not familiar with the Convergence Science Network, net Network since 2008, they have been engaging the public with advances in biomedical sciences that are shaping the future of healthcare. And the network promotes an understanding of the value of cross-disciplinary research uh, in resolving pressing issues in the biomedical sciences, which will be particularly um, uh, informative for this evening's uh, conversation. And this series, like the Local Women in Biomedicine series, celebrates the commitment, devotion and contribution of women to the advancement of science. And I'd like to acknowledge that the event was also made possible by the generous support of Emble Australia. So we're very honoured to have Edith contribute an hour of her precious time, and it is precious to tonight's discussion. So I really urge you all to please seize this opportunity and feel free to put your questions to Edith. Edith. Um, I'm here to guide the discussion. I've got some questions that I would like to put to Edith, but we want this to be really as interactive as possible with you as the audience. Um, please add your questions via the chat function to the right of your screen, which you should be able to see. Feel free to ask a question at any time if there's something that we're talking about and you would like to ask a question relating to that discussion point, then please ask it at the time uh, and, uh, and we'll try to get your questions in and have it uh, run pretty smoothly like that. And of course, we're on Twitter and if you'd like to keep the conversation going, um, you can use the hashtag women in biomedicine. So it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our special guest for this evening, Professor Edith Hurd. Uh, a bit of background on Edith. Uh, she obtained her PhD from the Imperial Cancer Research Fund, which is now Cancer Research UK, uh, then spent nine years at the Institut Pasteur in Paris before undertaking a one-year sabbatical at Cold Spring Harbour. In 2001, she set up her own group at the Institute Curie and in, ten, in 2010 became director of that institute's genetics and developmental biology unit. She was appointed as professor of the Collège de France in 2012 and she held the chair of epigenetics and cellular memory. And in January of 2019, Edith started as the director general of EMBL. I'm going to ask Edith to kindly give us a bit of an overview of her research, um, but you'll probably know that her group was among the first to show the dynamic nature of epigenetic X chromosome inactivation. Uh, and much of her lab's work is focused on the X activation center locus that regulates um, this inactivation process. Edith's group was also one of the first to describe topologically associating domains or TADs in collaboration with Job Decker, which we, work which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And Edith's current research focuses on understanding how chromatin and chromosome organisation participate in gene regulation. Excuse me, for this work, Edith and her laboratory have been recognised by many, many prizes and fellowships and degrees, too many to mention right now, but they're all on the event website and they're all very prestigious. Most recently, Edith received the L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science International Award. She's a fellow of the Royal Society, an EMBO member, a foreign associate of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States, an international member of the National Academy of Medicine of the United States, and a member of the German National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina. Edith has participated in numerous scientific boards and is currently a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the CNRS in France, uh, the BRIC in Denmark, IMBB in Greece, the CRIC in London, and the World Health Organization Science Council. Well, welcome, Edith. Hi, I'm very happy to be here with you. I just wish I was actually there, <laughs> but I'm very we happy. Wish here too. We wish you were here too. I hear you've not been to Australia before. Oh, I have, I have, I have. Oh, I have? came, uh, yeah, absolutely. About, I don't know, 12 years ago, uh, and I spent three weeks, and I came to Melbourne, and I, I visited all sorts of wonderful places. So, yes, I have, and I'm a huge fan of oh, Australia. Oh, fabulous. Fabulous. Yeah. Well, we're very excited to be talking with you tonight. Um, 
obviously you've had an extremely impressive career to date. It was quite the introduction. And I'd love to talk with you a little bit about how you got to be where you are today. But first, uh, perhaps we can kick things off if possible with you giving a bit of an overview of your research, um, some of the major discoveries you've made, and just to put them in perspective, how they've changed our fundamental understanding of things like gene regulation, development, and biology. Wow, <laughs> I'll try. Um, well, well, so part. thank you. <laughs> thank you, Claire. Um, so I'll try and, and keep it short and simple. I mean, I started working on X inactivation back in 1990 as a postdoc at the Pasteur in Phil Abner's lab. And at the time, we knew that it's a process that has to happen during development in females. You have to shut down one of the two X chromosomes in order to achieve dosage compensation. Um, and if one of the two X is, is not inactivated during early development in a female embryo, the embryo dies. So we knew it was an essential process, but we really knew so little about how it set up. And understanding how you switch off almost a thousand genes on um, a whole chromosome during development is something that feeds into not only developmental biology, but also uh, gene regulation on a chromosome wide scale. And in fact, it fits right into the topic of epigenetics. So without being trained in epigenetics at all, I was a geneticist if, and a molecular biologist. I ended up sort of starting to explore this area of epigenetics through X chromosome inactivation. And so epigenetics being the um, changes of gene expression that can be stable but reversible and do not affect uh, DNA sequence. In other words, these are not changes in, in, in the genome, they're changes in the way the genome is expressed. And this has to be stably propagated across um, cell divisions. And in the case of X inactivation, what's fascinating is that you have to shut down one of the two X chromosomes in the same cell, in the same nucleus. And how does that work? How does the cell know that it has two Xs? And how does it know that it has to switch off one X and not the other? Otherwise, that's even worse. The cell will just die, not, the, not only the embryo. So, so that was when I came in, we, we really knew very little. And I was very lucky because it was just the moment where the discovery of the key gene that triggers X inactivation happened. And that gene actually produces an encoding RNA called EXIST that stands for X inactive specific transcript. And now my, my job, my, my project was to try and work out what is the minimal region of the X chromosome that will allow X inactivation to happen in a female cell. And it had been kind of defined uh, by genetics, cytogenetics, translocations, deletions, but it was a huge region. And right in the middle of it, there was this non-coding RNA. So I started with what seemed like a a project that had been made simple because of this discovery that was made by several labs. Um, but in fact, it ended up taking me many, many years. And it led me into understanding a lot more about how gene regulation happens, first of all, as a postdoc and then with my, my lab. So what we discovered was that in order for this exist non-coding RNA to be expressed properly and monoallelically, you actually need a very large region with lots of long range elements um, in cis. And it took me about a decade of trying to define this region using transgenes and failing actually. So, you know, I would say the beginning of my career was marked by failure, which made me a very robust scientist probably. But anyway, so we were hunting and hunting to find out what this region was. And then I came across this technology um, with uh, through meeting Job Decker, who's this uh, fantastic um, wonderful scientist who had developed this chromosome confirmation capture technology. And so um, a student in my lab, when we set up the lab, tried to um, apply this to our region because it captures all the sequences um, in cis genome wide, but also in trans. And so we applied a version of this technology and we realized that the exist gene lies in this very unusually, we thought, organized region um, of several hundreds of kilobases that seem to interact with each other preferen preferentially um, around the promoter of EXIST, and then another region that interacts preferentially around 
uh, um, the three prime end of exist and an anti sense. So, so we were really intrigued by this. And for about a couple of years, we kept repeating the experiment thinking, why are these regions interacting like this? And it turns out that this was a genome wide phenomenon. And that's how we fell, up, fell upon TADS or topologically associating domains. And it was thanks to that study that we discovered that in fact, these TADS, and in the case of the exist gene, there's a 500 KB TAD at one end and then a, a 300 KB TAD at the other end. And they seem to be able to partition um, the two parts of this locus so that it's properly developmentally regulated. So that was one of the big discoveries we made. And, and I mean, I think, you know, it opened up several more questions, of course. Um, and then, and I can, I'm, I won't go into those in detail, but then the next thing um, that I wanted to say was that we started to look in vivo at what happens during development because the X chromosome is a very important one. It carries more than a thousand genes many of them are really critical. And so we wanted to actually look during development to find out what the dynamics of X inactivation is. And that's where we were, we came across these amazing surprises that we weren't expecting at all. So in fact, the chromosome gets shut down early on, and then it gets reversed, it gets switched on again, and then it gets shut down again. So this dynamics of epigenetic changes was not really expected. And it turns out that it's something that we've realized now happens at many regions of the genome um, during development and getting getting the epigenomes right and making sure that you have the right sets of genes on or off during development, of course, is essential. And on the, chrom on the X chromosome, it seems that indeed you have to shut down genes early on, but then you can let them come back on. And of course, the big question is why, and, and that's something that we're, we're asking right now, but maybe one of the big surprises, and I think this is very relevant then to my contacts in Australia. So I, I met and I know Jenny Graves very well. She's one of my, my heroes in science and, and she was a very inspiring um, leader and scientist. And, and so thinking about things in an evolutionary context is something that we have always um, done. And we decided to look at the dynamics of X inactivation in other mammals, not just in the mouse, which was our main model. We looked in rabbits and we looked in human embryos and what we found was that the kinetics and the changes are, are quite different. So there's a lot of evolutionary diversity in this process. Even though it's conserved as a process, you need to dosage compensate. It's very diverse in an evolutionary sense in terms of the, the exact mechanisms. So this is what we're really um, trying to work out now is what are the needs um, and what are the mechanisms at different stages of development in different mammals? And we're still focusing very much on the mouse, but we also have collaborations uh, with people working on other organisms. And one thing that I just wanted to say is that it, you know, X inactivation has been, it was a bit of a specialized field for many years, but suddenly it's become into the radar because people are realizing that there are a lot of diseases that are sex biased. And for a long time, people thought this was about hormones. You know, um, we have different hormones, men and women. That's what sex bias and disease is about. And of course, a lot of it is. But in fact, it turns out that there are an awful lot of genes on the X chromosome that don't actually get completely inactivated. And so females have a double dose of some of these genes compared to males. And this can vary between individuals. It can vary between females. And so this means there's a lot more diversity in gene expression states with, with, within females and we're mosaics for our X inactivation patterns. And that actually is really important in terms of how women are treated because some of these genes are really important. For example, in the immune system, there's one gene on the X that's called TLR7 for toll light receptor seven. And it turns out this is a gene that escapes from X inactivation to different extent, extents. And it's directly linked to um, lupus and to, and there are many genes on the X that could be linked to autoimmune diseases. And we know that in the case of lupus, 90% of, of patients are female. So we're actually working on the mechanisms that allow or, or regulate this variable capacity of genes to be silenced and to escape because they have very important implications for um, female specific characteristics and also for diseases. And we think that this is really important when you're thinking about treating people, um, you know, most of the medications that we take as women are actually tested on men or on um, on, on uh, male mo mouse models or rats or whatever. And 
so the reasons for that, you know, we could discuss, but anyway, historically, that's the way it's happened. So basically, women are mainly treated as mini men when they're given drugs. So we would really like to try and help understand what the differences are in gene expression profiles that could, could be different between men and women, and how that could then feed into perhaps better precision medicine, which of course is what um, everyone would like to see in the future. I mean, it's wonderful. It's it's hugely inspiring. We've got comments coming in on the chat just saying how good is science, and I think um, I think that that your overview there uh, it does it what what it really highlights is the complexity, the beauty of science um, and of discovery, and also the importance of understanding context. And I know that this is a a, a big thing for you, and it's it's really guided the Emble program. Um, for the next five years is, you know, you talk about life in context and we'll get um, to, to talk about that. Actually, it's an impressive, very impressive document. But, um, but, uh, but you know, I guess that that's a good introduction to the idea that, you know, when we're doing science, how important is the, is the context in which we study and, and how often are we missing things because our models are biased towards one or the other because historically okay. that's what we've always used. And I guess, uh, you know, we can talk about it later, but did you want to perhaps give a little bit of an introduction to that idea about life in context? Yeah, I mean, I think working on something like X inactivation, which, you know, it's it's a fundamental process, it needs to happen, but it uh, kind of opens up um, one's eyes to the fact that there's an awful lot of things that feed into it. And you know, why do some genes escape on the inactive X? And why does this vary between individuals? And is it because of context? Is it because of, you know, the, um, of course, it's some of it is genetically encoded, but some of it could be also environmentally influenced, you know, what we eat, the drugs we take, etc. So that, in a way, as an epigeneticist, I have to think about context all the time. Our genome is not just read and expressed and, you know, in, in, in the same way in every situation, you know, even clones, twins, there's variation. And that's about, um, you know, life experience processes. It's about what we're exposed to. So this new program, um, which was built up actually with all of my colleagues at EMBL, you know, we had a huge brainstorming back in 2019 when I started. And there were people working on many, many different systems, you know, basic research, but you know, it's research that always feeds into applications when possible, but it's still very curiosity driven. And, you know, we, we realize, well, what do we need to do now? And of course, we can understand an awful lot of biology in laboratories by looking at very, very well controlled systems. And now we can, you know, manipulate the genome and very precision ways. We can even, you know, manipulate gene expression using techniques like optogenetics. And we always do this in a very controlled way because we don't want too much variation. You know, that's a whole, you know, in science, we want to be as reproducible and as robust as possible. But then we realize that actually real life happens out there. You know, um, we are not clones. We're not um, always uh, behaving in the same way. The environment does influence the way um, we as people, but, you know, all life interacts. And and I love this expression that, you know, if the, if the unit of... Uh, of an organism, the basic unit of life in an organism is the cell. Well, at the, the level of the planet, the basic unit of a planet is an ecosystem. So it's many organisms, it's communities, and they're exposed to different, both uh, physical, chemical, and biological um, stimuli. Some of them are positive, some of them are, are negative, and some of them are absolutely essential. And so we realize that we want to try and understand life in that context. And it's it's interesting because when we started to come up with this idea of, you know, trying to understand life in the context of ecosystems, one of the things that we discussed was, you know, where are there going to be new pathogens emerging? How is that going to happen? This was before the pandemic hit us. And we'd already started to discuss, you know, how, what, what does it take for a pathogen to, uh, you know, jump from one species to another? How does the immune system respond to that? What is what are the vectors for antimicrobial resistance propagation? Why does it happen more in some environments than others? So these were the sorts of questions we, we decided Emble as an organization could answer. And the key to this was we don't want to answer it on our own. We want to do it in collaboration because the people who work at Emble, you know, there are up to 2000 people here. We're specialized in things like genomics, uh, development of biology, medical genetics. 
But in fact, we need to collaborate with other disciplines, including um, epidemiologists, if we're thinking about pandemics, ecologists, if we're thinking about biodiversity collapse. And so that is really how this new program um, was set up. It's about understanding the molecular mechanisms of life at the level of ecosystems and doing it in a very collaborative way so that we can make bridges with, with new disciplines and with different scientists in different countries, including in Australia. Wonderful. And, it, and, and in fact, that's a, that's a wonderful segue, I think, uh, into perhaps going into a little bit of detail, if you would, about EMBL itself, because there might be some people in the audience that might not be so familiar with what EMBL is. It really is, um, as you say, an incredible model of this idea about what you can achieve when you break down barriers and when you bring people together in a truly collaborative way crossing, you know, nations, crossing uh, intergovernmental uh, um, uh, in, in that context. Um, and, of course, Australia, people might not be aware, but Australia is actually an associate um, member of EMBL. It joined in 2008 with the um, support of the federal our government. Absolutely. I'm sorry? You, you were our first associate member and uh, really important and, and incredibly active, actually. So um, Australia is a very important part of EMBL. Yeah. Well, can you please so give us some background into um, what EMBL actually is, yeah. uh, okay. why and how it was formed? And, and also, I mean, I guess you've touched on the importance of forming I guess a community of of that, that's comprised of your member states, but everybody sort of has a common ambition. I guess so. Yeah. I'd really like to get your perspective on uh, the importance of that approach. Yeah, I mean, so EMBL was actually set up in 1974 and modelled on CERN. The idea being to try and, you know, keep molecular biologists working as a community. And in fact, to set up um, infrastructures and share knowledge in a way that was very, uh, you know, embracing, that, that would bring people together. And I think, you know, the pandemic has really shown us how important it is that countries can share knowledge and resources and collaborate and, and that, you know, there are strategic directions made that, that can help to deliver the right kind of research at the right time, but at the same time nurtures curiosity-driven basic research, because that, of course, is absolutely at the basis of then being able to, you know, pick up what a new technology could be that would allow, um, for example, something like a pandemic to, to be fought. And EMBL is a wonderful example of that, because we, we have five missions. We do excellent research, or we try to. We do, um, we provide service and infrastructure. So for example, uh, one of our six sites is the European Bioinformatics Institute uh, based in, in the UK, in Hingston. And that's one of the biggest bioinformatics institutes in the world. And we provide data, um, data resources, databases. Um, you, you know, we were the ones who allowed AlphaFold that was recently uh, released to, to be uh, open and accessible to all. So, uh, you know, right at our heart is this idea of open science and um, allowing swift knowledge um, sharing and discovery. And so we do this through our infrastructures and the services that we provide. But we also develop technology. So, for example, CryoEM, one of the inventors of CryoEM was a scientist at EMBL, Jacques Dubochet. He, he got his Nobel Prize in 2012 and he actually, or when, no, 2017, I think. And he sent it to EMBL because he felt that EMBL deserved the prize that allowed him to follow up his whatever, you know, uh, what might have seemed like a crazy approach, but that led to what everyone is using now, cryo-EM. Similarly for genomics, uh, genomics was really nurtured at EMBL back in the 1990s when, he, when, when the EBI was set up. And it's thanks to the tools that were set up then that the pandemic was fought, that we can actually, you know, share data, we can see that the um, we can model what's happening in terms of the evolution of the, the pandemic. We can we can go in and have data portals that are accessible to all. So, so EMBL is there to try and permit this to happen. And we also do innovation. So that's another of our missions is to try and help scientists um, link up to, you know, uh, industry or to, to sort of go in and, and, uh, and be innovative. And, and we have many spin-offs that come out of EMBL. And we like to share that knowledge as well, you know, how to do that. 
Um, and we train people. And that's something that we, I think our Australian partners are also very aware of. We train people at all levels from you know, students right at the beginning of their career through to group leaders. We have sabbatical programs and we train engineers. We have a new program called Arise, which is there to try and um, train up people who could become uh, technology developers or heads of uh, platforms for technologies. And so this is all the things that Amble does. And, and we're there to try and always be one step ahead as well. You know, we want to be at the forefront, at the cutting edge, in order to allow um, the best science to happen and to do it in an open and collaborative way. So we're kind of a glue that is constantly trying to evolve. And we can do that because we have this um, special model, which is that um, every five years we have to have a new program. And I, as I, I discussed, you know, our new program about life in context is called Molecules to Ecosystems. We get five years of funding supported by our member states and our associate member states that allows us to then explore what we can do together in a new area. And we always try to be one step ahead and to provide the the tools and develop the new tools that are needed for scientists and to make some of the discoveries that are essential. So that's what EMBL is about. Right now, there are 28 member states that um, support EMBL. We're independent of the European Union. Um, we're worldwide in the sense that what we deliver has worldwide impact, but also because some of our associate members, Australia being the first, actually is, um, you know, it's a global endeavor. And we try to allow as much uh, exchange and, and sharing of expertise as possible. And in the new program, there are a lot of new tools, actually, that will benefit our member states uh, more than ever before. And that includes some of our training programs and also our, you know, some of our, our data um, services, as well as some of our new platforms, for example, in genomic medicine um, and others. So, yeah, so that's what EMBL is about. And uh, we're constantly evolving because actually we have a model which is a nine year model. So everyone has to move on uh, within nine years. There are very few people that stay on at EMBL. And so we're constantly bringing in new people and allowing the people we've trained to, to go out. And so, and so that's why I think um, EMBL Australia has been a, a huge success in at least, in, you know, for, from our point of view, we view it, we think it's been a fantastic success because EMBL Australia really sort of set up um, this network of uh, research groups of, of labs that are kind of modeled on the way EMBL works. So, you know, this is with six institutes across Australia and, and that work together and they not only follow the way we do things, but link up to us and to some of our other partnerships as well. So it's a very good way of being international. Um, and I'd be happy to tell you more about that. Yeah, so I, I had a, you, you touched on a couple of things that I wanted to ask you about. One was the nine year um, uh, rule, actually, because I read that and I thought, oh my goodness, that's even for group leaders, which I was quite surprised Everyone. at. Um, and I'd love to ask you uh, about that. I might just ask you just a little bit because you touched on um, Australia's role in EMBL. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I guess I wanted to get your perspective on where you think Australia can really contribute. Uh, to EMBL's research program, especially over the next five years, um, given that uh, okay. that you initiated, a, a, you know, that that five year um, uh, time frame, uh, and also how does Australia contribute to EMBL achieving their sort of greater vision in a way? Well, I think um, it it already has it. I, you know, many of the um, topics that are covered at EMBL are. I would say relevant to Australian science and even more so in the new program. And so some of the new topics or new areas that um, are in this new program include um, themes like human ecosystems, infection biology, planetary biology, microbial ecosystems and data science, which is actually really at the heart of the whole program. And we realize that actually having discussed, um, you know, with many people, uh, and in particular, the, the Australian delegates for EMBL, these are very well aligned with Australia's national priorities. And so what we hope is that there are going to be even closer collaborations on these topics. So I mentioned, for example, genomic medicine. I think this is an area where we can really help provide some of the um, resources and know-how that could help 
Australia, but actually Australia is very, very well um, equipped um, with highly trained people in these areas too. So be it at the level of, you know, medical science or technological science, you know, um, some of the, 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 the great experts in uh, microscopy, there are many in Australia. And so we've just opened a new imaging center. And, you know, we're already discussing about the kinds of links that we could have to share um, knowledge and to, to help train people up. And then I think in the area of data science, it's clear that, that you know, there's a huge um, amount of interest and strength uh, amongst Australian scientists um, in, the, in the areas of bioinformatics, but going beyond that, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence. And I think this is something that really is, um, you know, the frontier right now. And I think Australia will be able to not only collaborate and benefit from what Embel is going to do, but contribute to this new program to make this a new era of, I would say, data science um, that feeds into true, uh, you know, uh, testing of hypotheses and coming up with solutions. And that's, that's what's wonderful about this new era of AI is that the, the data in biology is finally of good enough quantity and quality that we can start to exploit these, um, these types of approaches. So we're very excited um, about, you know, collaborating with Australia, both through our partnership lab. So, you know, the research groups that are, that are already part of the um, EMBL um, uh, labor uh, partner laboratory network. And, and, you know, that goes from um, thinking about uh, stem cells to immunology to RNA biology, and all of that fits super well into the new program. And there are some of the tools that we're going to develop, for example, postdoc exchanges, um, the PhD program, training courses we're going to have. And, you know, the pandemic has shown us that we can also do a lot more online than we ever could before. So a lot of what we used to do physically, we're actually now doing virtually, which actually makes it even easier for us to link up with um, our Australian partners and be useful. Yeah. Can I talk, can I ask you about this nine-year rule? Because yeah. I, when I read this and and uh, and Embel prides itself on high staff turnover, and which is, I guess, a different way of, of thinking about things. Normally we, we see high turnover as being a negative um, thing in a business or in an organisation, uh, whereas Embel has a rule that, you know, that every, that you, you can only stay for nine years and there's constantly staff turnover there. Can you just explain a little bit? Because it's a bit hard, you know, f to get your head around if you're not used to that idea. Why do you think Emble takes this approach? And how could this idea of high turnover really be a positive thing for science? And should we be doing this, you know, across the board? Yeah, I think so. For, for, first of all, you know, when EMBL was set up, um, I think, you know, one of the philosophies or the missions behind it was to really try and make sure that we nurture um, science and, uh, and, and the changes that we need to accompany in science. And the only way to do that is if you have turnover. So I think this idea of making sure that we bring people in, we train them up, and usually people come in quite young, you know, group leaders are usually hired straight out of their postdoc, or even in some cases, even without a postdoc, we have some group leaders who are, who are hired even just straight after their PhD. And we give them, you know, it's actually five plus four years in the case of uh, group leaders. We give them an opportunity to do pretty much what they want. We select them because, you know, they have the right attitude to science because they've they've got a good track record. But but also that they have this spirit of curiosity and uh, trying to explore areas that maybe wouldn't be explored in a more conventional setup. So we give them that opportunity with the facilities we have, with the services we have. But then we don't want to stagnate. So we need to be able to feed these people then back into our member states and into the world. And, you know, many of these people then go off and continue to be scientists and to run institutes or, or, or do other things. So it's almost part of our duty to do that. And it's not just about the group leaders. It's also about, um, you know, administrators. We have many people who get amazing international training when they come and work at EMBL. And then when they go back to their country or to another country, they can take that EMBL model with them. So it's actually part of our job as an intergovernmental organization and an international organization to try and help 
the world and help our member state countries in particular benefit from what we do. And that for me is, it's one of the, the key tools that we have is to propagate the EMBL model and our know-how in this way. And we can only do it with the turnover. Now, to be frank, it's really painful because you can imagine you hire people, you train them up, they come up with all sorts of wonderful new, you know, ideas, solutions. And of course, the tendency is to say, well, I want to keep these people because, you know, they're so good. I just want to let them carry on and, and, and let them flourish here. But we can't. And although it's painful, I think it actually is the best way. And, and I'll, I'll, it's almost this was one of my discoveries when I started here three years ago. People are extremely collaborative at EMBL, both internally and externally. And I've realized that one of the reasons for that is because everyone knows that they're in the same situation. Everyone knows that, you know, 90% of our staff turn over. So there isn't this, you know, tenor track, oh, well, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to have to sort of do my thing um, so that I can ensure that I can stay, you know, um, and, and, and be tenured. That just doesn't happen. And so people help each other out. And it's not even, it, so it, it's much easier actually to run at least a, a life sciences organization with this kind of turnover, even if, you know, letting people go, um, seeing them move on is painful. It's also wonderful to see them do it in a highly collaborative way. And so we have a huge number of alumni around the world who keep connected and who, who love EMBL and who propagate its model. So actually it's working really well and it's copied. And in fact, when I was in France at the Collège de France, uh, where I'm, I'm sort of a professor, I, I remember they set up um, some new institutes, one for biology, and they used the EMBL model. So with turnover, and then the physicists decided to do the same thing. So somehow the EMBL model is spreading from biology into other sectors as well. And of course, there are different needs and different dynamics in different fields. I, you know, maths and physics have a different dynamic to biologists, but at least for biologists, it works really well. And I do think that in every area of science, mobility and turnover are a good thing. And if it's done in a sufficiently accompanied uh, way, it's almost always a success. So it's absolutely fascinating. And I love and thank you for, for talking us through that, actually, because I think that when you explain it in the way that you have, it becomes quite obvious how something like a high turnover and taking that pressure off you know, everything you do now is going to lead to whether or not you're going to be successful in 20, 30 years in this, in that one place. I think, you know, it puts a huge amount of pressure. The competitive nature kicks in. I think it perhaps even contributes, or I'd like to get your thoughts on whether or not that environment um, contributes to the, some of the issues that we have around diversity, inclusion and equality in science and whether something like this, this model of high turnover could perhaps address some of those issues. What do you think about that? Um, absolutely. I mean, I think in terms of equality, diversity and inclusion, uh, you know, uh, I, I, we, we have a strategy now that we've set up with, a, you know, where we've taken it on uh, the, the bull by the horns, as they say, because uh, it's, it's an area that, you know, obviously is relevant to all institutes and organizations. And EMBL has the advantage that because we have this turnover, we can change the way we do things and, and we can bring in more people, uh, more diversity of all sorts. I'm not just talking about gender here. We can, we can strive to do that because we have this high turnover model. And what we've realized is to do this properly. And, you know, we're very humble about this. I'm not making great claims about, you know, Emble being uh, a model for EDI, that's what we should be and we're striving to be, but, you know, we, we need to do it properly. So that means at every level, from the, the moment you hire, from the policies you have, um, the, the, the training you give your leadership, the training you give your students, the attitude you have, the way you engage and you influence uh, the stakeholders that you come across. And because we, we come across many, many stakeholders at EMBL because we are intergovernmental. So, you know, we're in touch with ministries and we're in touch with other intergovernmental organizations and we're in touch with the public in, in some sectors. So, so in a way, it has to be ingrained at every level. And, it, and there is no... I mean, yeah, there's no silver bullet to salute, you know, to, there's no solution to making sure that we can become a properly diverse and inclusive organization. It has to be a systematic strategy at every level 
and you have to change attitudes and um and to do that you need people to come in to help that change and and so i do think that embol has an advantage that we should take advantage of <laughs> to to allow this kind of change to happen um would it help in other organizations i'm sure it would but i also acknowledge that it's not easy to have a high turnover in for example the institutes that i worked in previously were also set up on a nembel model the curie institute where i spent most of my my career as a group leader before i moved to embel was actually did apply the embel model but it's really difficult because in some countries it's not easy to continue in your career until you get a permanent position so so the tenure track is actually different in different places and and one has to be respectful of that. So I don't think you can just slam the Emble model on any institute and say well now you're just going to turn over. But I think one can strive to take parts of it. And what is key is to always try and stimulate mobility. And in science it's that's kind of what we're you know we're used to that. What scientists do is enjoy you know brainstorming, going to different meetings, going to different countries. And so it should be easy in scientific institutes and organizations to promote mobility and therefore to encourage inclusivity because of the dynamic that science should bring and of course you then fun. end up um no i mean it's it's wonderful this is i i i i hope everybody at home is enjoying this conversation because i i am certainly finding it really interesting and I, I guess when you do that when you mobilize people what you do is you establish new opportunities for people to come in as well so there's constantly opportunities for people um, and you're creating that and i think yeah. you know in, in often it's it's a lack of opportunity that is that is a major issue um and that ultimately leads to you know some issues about uh with with equality and you know if people decide to go and do something else or they have a break for whatever reason then they end up um, missing out on some of those opportunities um, because they're no. few and far between. And maybe I could say a word there I mean you know well first of all it's about opportunities but also dealing with biases and you know there is a lot of unconscious bias that you know we have to acknowledge that and we have to work with it but then there are some obvious things that we can do to help um people as you said you know sometimes people have to step away um the, the pandemic was a really good example of that where because of the constraints put on people they had to you know make make the decision about looking after family or you know um taking time out because because of the situation and and the the constraints that 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 imposed on households and at least in the case of women in science this is something that embol has tried to take on board so we have at least two different um programs that we've just started one is called um leap which is a leadership excellence for aspiring women um program and it started uh, i think back in 2021 where we provide um mentors for young female scientists to try and accompany them through you know the decision making steps in their career to try and allow them to you know make the right decisions and not be frightened or worried or put off um by what could be a perception of a not so inclusive future and a career ladder and then the other program that we set up is called um helping hands and it's a way to try and help women um who have to during maternity leave so they don't have to step away completely or so that their science doesn't have to stop completely to get technical help that you know someone who can come in and continue to do some experiments or to finish things up when a woman has to stop for maternity leave so these are you know very practical fairly simple solutions that can i think make a huge difference um to some women who it's you know when they get to that stage in their career i've seen it i'm sure you've seen it often sort of weigh things up and think well actually is it worth it it's a lot of um you know it's a lot of work to be a scientist and to hang on in there and so we want to try and help that and you know fix this leaky pipeline as it's called so women do um hang on in there so that's just a couple of examples of course being inclusive is not just about women um but at least you know there are some things that i think can be done by institutes that don't take that much trouble or finance um and and could be also signals that 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 we care and that we are taking action and i think that's one of the most important thing is to give the right signals and the right attitude so people take note 
Absolutely wonderful. And and a question also, uh, you know, the the huge network that Embel creates with its uh, member states. Do you think that those networks are important to young women in STEM, and especially, for example, women in Australia who might be, you know, they're, they're pretty far away from from Europe. Um, we're we're not isolated, but we're 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 physically away from from the rest yeah. of the world. Um, what what role do you think the networks um, play, that, especially the ones that Emble have established in inclusivity? Absolutely crucial, I hope, I feel. <laughs> um, so, you know, young scientists, and actually not just the scientists, as you know, there are people who um, are working in our uh, services departments, you know, engineers, people who do curation of data. So this is a network which is international, by nature, we have more than 93 nationalities working at EMBL right now. And because we're international by nature, and because we have these partnerships, for example, as in Australia, we get people together, and we we really try to allow them to help each other out. We also have our alumni network, as you as I mentioned earlier. And the idea is that our alumni can help others in their home countries, if that's where they go, try and make use of what Emble is about. And I think for women, it really is important to feel that there is a sort of, um, yeah, a network. I mean, I wouldn't call it a sorority, but sometimes it is. And I think at every stage in one's career, because it's still fragile, because, you know, it is it is not yet um, equal in any way for women in, in their careers in science, be it biology or others. I think it's important that there is the capacity the opportunity to exchange, not necessarily to just have role models, but to really be able to have dialogues and ask questions, you know, so that when someone is in a moment of doubt or if someone needs some promotion, and, you know, it's very clear that women are much less likely to ask for a promotion or to think about, you know, putting themselves forward for um, a prize or whatever. So it's up to others to help do that. And that's what we try to do with our networks, our partnerships, you know, provide the science um, as a kind of glue for people. So we collaborate on projects, et cetera. We provide advice at many different levels. We provide career advice, for example. And, and at all those levels, I feel that this is how we can help women. And this is why our strategy that I mentioned earlier that we set up this EDI strategy really is designed to try and help um, all of our member states and all the women in our member states. So we have this gender equality plan 2022 to 2026. And it really is about trying to create, you know, a new inclusive research and working culture with a number of different axes. And it's, I'm, I'd be happy to, to give you links to that. And it, this is the way I think that we can help women um, at every stage of their careers. And obviously, um, you know, being physically further away, Australia might feel that it's it's less easy. But in fact, as I said, the pandemic shown us that we can network like crazy without having to be in the same room. And Emble is used to that. You know, we have six sites in, in five different countries. So we're constantly talking to each other as well, uh, as well as to our 28 member states. And we have different tricks for doing that, you know, be it by Zoom, by, virtually, and also by having um, dedicated site, you know, get togethers, which of course are important. So this is why I really regret that I haven't made it to, to Australia yet. I was going to actually last year, that was the plan. But I promise I'm going to come soon. And I'm going to bring some of my colleagues with me. And I hope that this will be an opportunity to, you know, bring Emble into Australia even more than we already are now. Wonderful. We would we would absolutely love that. But as you say, you know, I think with technology and and we've been forced into this situation where we're communicating a lot more online. But it has shown us that, you know, that that, that it's broken down again some of these barriers that that were perhaps up before. Now we can have conversations uh, across the world um, as we're doing tonight. And I think your point of um, women speaking to each other and, and kind of having each other's back in a way um, is is very useful um, in, in just having, being able to have open and honest discussions with people who have perhaps yeah. found themselves in a similar situation, I think is perhaps critical. Yeah, absolutely. I think having the conversations and also, you know, thinking things through 
as a community. It's not just about women thinking about it. We all have to think about it together. And, you know, I know, I know an awful lot of men who care a lot about making sure that things are done in a, in a much more balanced way. And it's not just about professional life. It's also about home life. And we have to be able to enable that. And so that does require a strategy and, and different tricks. And so there are some things we recently had a meeting on, um, you know, what causes gender imbalances in academia um, and how to overcome them. That was a meeting we had, I think it was last, or maybe it was at the end of 2020 and, and the talks are actually online. It was a fantastic meeting. And out of that, you know, we had a lot of discussions and round tables as well and brilliant talks. And there are a number of things that came out, which is, for example, you know, we really need to have proper processes and structures to allow gender and diversity in academia. And that goes across the board from the hiring, the evaluation, the promotion, career development. We need to think about, you know, meritocracy. We need to revisit how we evaluate people, how we hire people. You know, we need to have narrative CVs. We need to stop just getting people have a good pitch. You know, there's this kind of ditch the pitch ambition that I think we should have and that really assesses what it is that makes for excellent um, academic uh, scientists but also not just in academia in, in business and in industry as well. Um, we need to recognize the work-life balance and as I said this is not just about women it's about all of us and how to make it possible and acceptable to do you know what can be high intensity work uh, and yet take care of a family. And the family doesn't just mean kids. It means parents and grandparents and others, uh, but, you know. And we need to try and embrace our differences more than ever before. And this acknowledgement that, you know, we, we're probably you know, the, the first generation that really is thinking hard about this and has the capacity to do something about it. So we need to be much more aware, much more responsive and um, creative and, you know, I go back to this kind of unconscious bias thing. We have to be innovative about how we deal with this. And, and I think, you know, we, with the younger generation, I can already see that change is definitely possible, but it has to be consistent. You know, I'm an epigeneticist and I know about plasticity. If you don't do something for long enough, then it just goes back, it falls back to default. And so we have to do this in a sustainable way. And, and that means setting up the right processes, the right policies, and the right communication so that we really do end up with a, a proper, you know, inclusive environment, at least in science and hopefully in the rest of the world. But I do think that science is a great way to promote equality and diversity. Thank you so much, Edith. I, I'm conscious that we've just gotten so uh in in uh excited about that that conversation topic that we've 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 talked about it for a long time but i actually think that it's um it's extremely important and your insights have just been absolutely fascinating and i'm i am particularly enjoying um hearing specifically about some of the initiatives that Embel is uh is using to try to overcome some of these major issues and i'm just uh you know i'm sort of buoyed by the fact that uh, Embel is obviously in very good hands uh, with you as their director general right now um, in trying to tackle some of these issues. And, and hopefully, as you say, they have trickle down effects because people do internationally look to Embel as the leaders. Absolutely. I, and I, I, I think it is actually our, our duty to try and be a model in, in where we can. Um, of course, you know, we can't do everything. But at least when it comes to science and um, science culture, I really hope that this is something that we can um, promote and to do it in a in a very rapidly evolving way, because the world is evolving rapidly. And so as an organization, we have the flexibility to do that. And, you know, again, the pandemic showed us we had to rise up. We you know, the world was not really prepared. But Emble, because we had infrastructure, because we had people who were willing to sort of roll their sleeves up and just get on with it, you know, we we were we had our infrastructures open, so um, some of the vaccines that were being used were, could be tested. Uh, we provided, as I said, data portals, and some of the challenges of tomorrow. I hope that Emble will be equally useful, um, and maybe we can even prevent some of these uh, <laughs> challenges, uh, including the challenge of. Uh, uh, equality, diversity, and inclusion. I should say, I mean, I feel it, it's such a strange time in the world. You know, the war that is 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 now going on 
it, it, we all feel, I think, a bit helpless uh, and appalled at what's going on. Um, I think, you know, Emble again is trying to see how we can help because we're here to promote science can we at least try to nurture this open scientific community and make sure that we we don't end up, you know, destroying um, the, the the corridors of knowledge transfer, etc. So it's a very difficult time for the world um, and for Europe in particular. Uh, and again, Embol is very actively thinking about how we can help make sure we preserve the scientific community and you know our mission to try and help you know, promote knowledge and discovery and, and not see uh, too much of, of that being impacted by the latest challenge, yeah. I'd like to thank, um, we've had a few comments on our um, on our chat, in particular, John, for um, a number of comments that are quite um, insightful. He says, the more scientific we all become, the better off we will be. And I think um, you've you've made Absolutely. some, it's, it's very true, isn't yeah. it? And, Actually, I just maybe I could just mention one thing. Uh, you know, we we do have a career advice office, and people often say to me, you know, how many of your scientists stay in academia or whatever? It's like we are encouraging our scientists not just to stay in academia. If there were more scientists who were politicians, if there were more scientists who were journalists, if there were more scientists who were, you know, policymakers, economists, or whatever, the world would be a better place. I totally agree with his comment. And so we really do try to explore with people what their, you know, what their ambition is. And we just published a paper, or we, we have an, a paper on bioarchives where we follow the trajectories of many of our scientists. So you, you know, very happy to, to look that up, um, looking at career trajectories of scientists that come through EMBL. And we really sincerely believe that the, the future of the world relies on scientists occupying many, many different areas. And, uh, and I and I think this is something that we we're actively working on again in the new program. Yeah. Wonderful. We might we the time has gotten away from us. I can't believe it. It's flown. It's been so wonderful. Um, there is a, a question from Manuel Baish. I hope I'm sorry for the pronunciation. I really am. Um, but they have asked uh, a question about your science. So we've got about five minutes left, and I wonder whether we might be able to very quickly ask it. They've said, um, if possible, uh, can we ask about your epigenetics of X chromosome and language codification superiority, development and communication? Wow, that's a that's an amazing question. <laughs> We've got about um, three minutes. Too much okay, to go. I'm not sure. I, can, I completely understand it, but um, maybe the way I'll answer it is just to say that it is clear um, that the way um, you know. Uh, females and males develop and brain function, um, there, there can be differences. I mean, absolutely. And I mentioned this earlier, um, you know, and it's not just hormonal, there are um, epigenetic differences on the X chromosome. On, and and so, so this is an area that I think is very actively being looked at. And to what extent, for example, I'm, you know, I'm not a neurobiologist, but I know that there are studies where tr people are trying to look at the fact that there is this diversity because of X inactivation and, and variable escape. To what extent might there be more opportunities in a female brain to make certain connections than there might be in a male brain? Or maybe there are differences in the way, you know, behavior is um, set up during um, early life uh, because of sex chromosome content. Now, it's a very dodgy uh, or controversial subject, I should say. But it is an area where I feel like now we have molecular tools to really try and understand how things happen in the brain. Uh, of course, you know, using animal models, people can go quite far. And we would be fascinated to know, uh, you know, to what extent does an XX versus an XY or an XO individual, to what extent is there diversity in the way uh, brain development happens and, and also then the stimuli that come in? So, of course, then that feeds into you know, language communication, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go very far on that because I'm not an expert. And I firmly believe that however many differences there are between men and women at the level of sex chromosomes, we're very good also at developing skills that don't actually depend on our sex chromosome necessarily. <laughs> um, so in fact, I'm not sure I've answered the question, but um, this idea of language codification superiority, I'm, I, I wouldn't really be able to address, but 
that there are differences in development. Absolutely, that's that for sure. An XX and an XY individual do develop slightly differently. And I think that's probably a, a good place to to maybe start our wrap up and and just acknowledge that perhaps I, I guess the theme maybe of of tonight's discussion was that we should be embracing diversity and our differences and understanding the basis of those uh, of the dif of those differences and what leads to diversity and the importance of um, that in, into contributing to a rich uh, ecosystem. Um, which ultimately leads to uh, a more successful uh, community. So perhaps we'll wrap up um, with that. Um, now, I just have a, a couple of notes to say that thank you, everybody, for joining us. Of course, thank you to Edith for her wonderful um, uh, time and, and, and conversation. I, I personally found it um, very fulfilling. So thank you so much, Edith, for sharing thank your time you, with Claire. us. Thank you, being an excellent uh, questioner and animator. Thank you so much. Wonderful. And thank you to everybody in the audience who have joined us tonight. Um, you'll be asked to complete a two-minute uh, anonymous survey uh, just in terms of your feedback so that the Convergence Science Network can um, make sure that their events are worthwhile for you in the future. And thank you um, for your commitment to everybody who's been making comments in the chat as well. Uh, again, uh, thank you to uh, Emble Australia for their very kind support of tonight's event. Um, and to Edith, we very much hope to see you in Australia very, very soon. Um, I know Convergence Science Network would absolutely love to host you uh, if you wanted to give a very in-depth uh, presentation on your on your science. I, I have a feeling you might have one or two presentations ready to go. Yeah, and I, I forgot to say, talking about diversity, you know, Australia is an amazing country for the diversity of mammals um, that do dosage compensation in many, many different ways. So I'm I'm a huge fan of the science that happens in that area too, in my area. Um, and, you know, from marsupials to monotremes, uh, I would be very happy to come and discuss with uh, some of my, my colleagues in Australia soon too. But just to say thank you so much. And I do want to say that Emble Australia and our partnership with, with Australia is one of the most important. And we will be looking to nurture the contacts and be as useful as possible in the in the coming years and really excited about that actually very excited i think we're all Thank excited you. and we can't wait to see what uh, what the future holds for yourself and for emble as well Thank you, Edith. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and hopefully we'll see you at future Convergence Science Network events. Goodbye.